And then the other piece was around conversations that you asked about. How do we improve that? I have a couple of thoughts on this. So the first one is how do we get better generally at conversation? So what is small talk at the end of the day, Randy? It's two strangers having an unprepared conversation. That's really what it is at the end of the day. So how can we practice for this? There's an exercise I teach that really applies across the board. And it's the first exercise I get people to do, which is called the random word exercise. Take a word like phone or jaguar or hemp seeds. I just got hemp seeds on my desk. So I'm using hemp seeds. Just completely random. It's nothing to do with the expertise. And you create a presentation out of thin air. In order to live an extraordinary and abundant life, you must focus on your internal battle and win within. My name is Randy Wilson, and welcome to the Rich Mind Podcast. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today, if you are an aspiring leader, if you are a leader of executives, of an executive team, uh, let's say you're even aspiring to start your own business, uh, or maybe you, you're a leader of a family. For myself, obviously, as a, as a father of three children, and obviously, I'm trying to lead them the best way I possibly can. One skill set you've got to get control of and become a master at is communications. It's so crucial to be able to communicate your passions and your ideas and your visions effectively, right? To get those people that are listening to you and that are following you to take advantage and be able to uh, help them lead better lives moving forward. So today, I'm going to have a fantastic conversation with Brendan Kumar, with Brendan Kumar Asami. So Brendan is a master communicator and a communications coach. He's the founder of Master Talk, which is a which is a YouTube channel which focuses on providing free access to communication tools for everyone in the world. With his coaching and training, Brendan's goal is to help ambitious executives and entrepreneurs become top 1% communicators in the industry. So that's kind of the whole topic and theme of today's episode. We're going to talk about communication. We're going to talk about the importance of communication. I've been the leader of teams in my retail background. I used to manage 30 to 50 people at any given time. And I will tell you that the skill set of being able to communicate effectively was very important in that role. And then if you're ever trying to, like I said, build a business, lead a family, super, super important, which is why I'm so excited about this conversation. So let me just stop babbling here and bring Brendan on the show. Brendan, welcome. Randy, the pleasure is mine. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. So I went through the high level bullet point list, a little bit about yourself. Uh, one thing I didn't add in there, I think you're coming to us today from Montreal, Canada, which is super cool. I love connecting with folks all over the world, which is just super neat. But at the same time, take a few minutes, go deep, share a little bit about yourself, uh, where the communication idea came from within yourself and uh, yeah, how you're trying to help people get better at that skill set. Absolutely, Randy. Happy to talk about that. So like you said, my journey started in Montreal, Canada. I was born and raised in Montreal. And for those of you who don't know, Montreal is a city where you need to learn to speak French. So when I was five years old, my dad comes up to me, Randy, and he says, you need to go to French school. And I looked at him and I panicked and I said, there is no way I'm going to study in French because I didn't know a single word of French. But he said to me, you know, Brandon, if you want to be successful in this city, you need to know the language. So we're going to force you into French school, which of course I'm super grateful today. But because of the that, Randy, the first few years of my life was very difficult when it came to communication anyways, because I didn't know the language. So every time I would give a presentation in front of a group of first graders or second graders, I'd look at the room and go, uh, bonjour. And that was my life growing up as a communicator. The second big challenge I had in my life is I had an accident when I was born. So my left arm is crooked because of the some mistake they made in the operation when I was coming out of my, my mom. And I think the 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 main takeaway there was, you know, I, not only did I not know the language, I was super self-conscious around communication too, because people would always look at my arm, not my face whenever I was speaking. So I never really grew up with a passion for speaking, Randy. It was never really something I wanted to do. Like when I was 12 years old and we do those, in French, we called it the album de finissant, which in English is the yearbook, you know, and you write down the, the rear book and you write down, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And everyone writes down like astronaut or singer or some other thing. I wasn't one of those guys. I wrote down accountant because I was really good at math and I was really bad at everything else. And everyone who was smarter than me in that classroom went on to become doctors and engineers. And I said, I can't compete with these guys. So I'm being accountant. So then from the ages of 12 to 19, 
my life was relatively boring. I spent most of my days playing video games and studying really, really hard. And really the climax of my life really happened when I got to college and I started studying accounting because I wanted to, to be an accountant. And then I asked people, how do I get a job in accounting, Randy? And they all looked at me and they said, do case competitions. And I looked at them and I was like, what is a case competition? I've never heard of this before, which is basically professional sports for nerds. So other guys might be playing rugby or football, some other thing. I wasn't really one of those guys, Randy. I did presentations competitively. That's how I learned how to speak. So I initially did them to get a job. But then as I was older, I got older. I mostly did them out of competition, out of passion. I wanted us to win. And then I, I accidentally stumbled upon communication coaching because as I got older and I started winning competitions, I started coaching the other students to the same, not for money. I just wanted them to win. I was just ultra competitive. And that's what then led to master talk later in my career. So when you were learning, crafting your own, right, your own skill set, were you being taught by someone or were you coming up with the basically trial and error? Were you practicing and then implementing and then yes or no, good or bad, right? And then, and then pivoting kind of as you went? How, tell me about that. Fantastic question. I wish I had somebody teach me. Uh, I didn't really have that much money. You know, my parents were factory workers. So I didn't, uh, even the, the first, the suit that I wear, it's in my pictures when I do like webinars and stuff. But, you know, even the first uh, couple of competitions I did was the same suit I wore at prom because we got it for a hundred bucks at Sears and we couldn't really get anything else. So uh, I actually never learned from it. I wish I had, but I just couldn't afford somebody to help me. So how I learned was mostly through trial and error. And in retrospect, Rand, even if it took me a lot longer to master communication, it became a benefit to the general public when I started Master Talk because I had such a naivete around how I could actually do this. So I would just try something. And basically what I did is every day during lunchtime where everyone else is like watching a TV show or something, I was actually watching a TED Talk. So every day I would open a new TED Talk on YouTube and I would just watch it. I would learn something new. But when you watch hundreds of TED Talks, you eventually find the right pander. And then when I started coaching people, I had no idea what I was doing, Randy. I just said, oh, try this. And 90% of the time what I was teaching them wasn't working. But then maybe 10% of the time, Maybe I just had a knack for it. I don't really know. Like that one out of 10, I would teach them something and it would, would work. And I'd write that down. And really the aha moment was three years later when I was 22, Randy. This is a month before I started Master Talk. I had coached like 40 people on how to speak. So you kind of just develop the expertise. I always like to say great coaches would coach even if they weren't paid to do it. They just love coaching. And that was me. And then what happened is like when I started watching YouTube videos on speaking, somebody told me to watch videos like three, three years later. And I was like, people make YouTube videos on communication tips. I was that naive. And then I started watching all these videos. And then I said, wait a second. There's a gap between what that person is saying, who has 300,000 subscribers on YouTube and what I'm teaching the students. But I found so many inconsistencies that I thought, you know what, even if that guy's a PhD in communication, I think I know something about communication that he or she doesn't. And it was with that naivete that I started Master Talk in January of 2019. And you just went in, dove in headfirst from there, right? Teaching, trying to help coach people with the art and the skill set of, of the communication piece, right? Of being, doing it well. So the reason why I say that, even for my kids, I've got kids that are, my oldest is 26, my youngest is 22. Coming through high school, I encouraged strongly them to take like speech class. And I just knew, now there might not be a comparison to speech class to what the level, high level that you're teaching, right? But at the same time, the idea that I had though, was that the ability to communicate in front of a room, being uncomfortable with that process into the trial and error of that. That's kind of where I was going with that. That was something I, I wish that I would have pushed myself outside of my comfort zone in that aspect a lot more growing up. And so that's something I wanted for my kids to do as well, which is paid off well in the fact that they are able to communicate with even adults, right? Older folks that you would not really necessarily think that they could sit down and just have a conversation with people. Can you talk about how learning this skill set kind of relates down even to basic conversations with folks out there in real life and in society, I think people are sometimes even struggling with just the basics of just communication. 100% Randy. And, and I'm so glad also that you put your kids through speech class. I think that's amazing. They're lucky to have a dad like you. So that's awesome. 
They didn't think so at the time. <laughs> they don't. Well, it's like my dad, right? Like, uh, I, I thought he was a nightmare to me when I was younger. It's like, this guy's putting me through French, so I don't even know the language. But now when I look back at my life, you know, I can speak three languages fluently. So I think I think your eldest, usually when they're 25 or above, they start to appreciate their parents a little bit more, not too much more. A yeah, little we, bit more. We, we won't ask them. We, we won't put a poll out there and find out. But I understand what you're saying <laughs> for sure. <laughs> they definitely will when they have kids of their own. But yeah, but I think go. the 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 idea is okay. So that was one piece, and then the other piece was around conversations that you asked about. How do we improve that? I have a couple of thoughts on this. So the first one is how do we get better generally at conversation? So what is small talk at the end of the day, Randy? It's two strangers having an unprepared conversation. That's really what it is at the end of the day. So how can we practice for this? There's an exercise I teach that really applies across the board. And it's the first exercise I get people to do, which is called the random word exercise. Take a word like phone or jaguar or hemp seeds. I just got hemp seeds on my desk. So I'm using hemp seeds. Just completely random. It's nothing to the expertise. And you create a presentation out of thin air. And what this does is if you could make sense out of nonsense, you could make sense out of anything. So if you can talk about tissue boxes, it's going to be really easy for you to do small talk. That's one piece. The second angle to conversations is this idea that you can't really like everyone and not everyone will like you. You know, the analogy I like to give uh, clients or just people in general is let's say you meet somebody new of your few days, which is very rare for most of us. In a year, you might meet 100 people, and if you live 50 more years than your current age, let's say we're all 30 years old for example's sake, and we live until 80, well, that's 5,000 people, Randy. So you don't actually get to talk to that many people. So my philosophy is always with networking conversations, go to the people you like the most, add more value to them, pour more into them, and they'll just introduce you to their friends. That's the easiest way to go about it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. So folks rewind that if you are in the process of trying to get better at communication, right? Meeting folks, having those conversations. I know it can be a little bit of a uncomfortable situation sometimes, but at the same time, if you get good at it, you can quickly uh, rise yourself above your peers, right? Quickly when you're able to communicate effectively. So let's go into that random word exercise just a little bit. Obviously I don't want to give away your secret sauce, but at the same time, yeah, let's go into that. Let's talk about can you give us an example? You mentioned the phone, you mentioned different things. Can you maybe just give us a, a broad level view of kind of what that actually would look like? Absolutely, Randy. And the goal is to give away the secret sauce. You know, for well, me, let's go. the goal is to teach everything for free. And you know, the people who work with me, you know, they'll pay to do it, but that's fine. So let's demonstrate. Give me any word you want, Randy. And I want you to go super random so the audience knows that I'm not cheating. So pick something completely random, not like education or something. So, but it doesn't have to be a thing or anything like that. It's just a random word. It could be literally, it could literally be like asphalt or something like that. Well, don't pick that because I said asphalt, but like pick something else. Well, here's one that I'm looking at directly on your shirt. Charity. Charity. Awesome. So Randy did not give me the word charity. Watch me do the random word exercise in three, two, one. Ever since I was a kid, Randy, believe it or not, I did not believe in charities. I didn't like what they stood for. I didn't know where the money was going. And the biggest thing that I couldn't wrap my head around is why would people give money to charities? I'll tell you why I believe that. The reason I believed that as a kid was because I didn't grow up with a lot of money. You know, my parents were on minimum wage. So, and when you don't have a lot of money, your focus in life is how do you survive? How do you take care of the people that you love? And you know what I realized is as I was getting older, and I started finding more success. And more success doesn't mean making a million bucks a year. It means making 50K a year, 60K a year. I was like, wow, that's an insane amount of money. I started to realize that not only the life that I've given myself was great, but the opportunity and luck that the universe has given me to even achieve those things to begin with was something I couldn't control. But unlike me, there's other people who don't get luck. Who get placed into situations where even if they worked really hard, they couldn't get the results. And that's why over time, I've came to love charities with the right research and the right commitment because they're able to fill in and bridge that gap. So what is my message to the world? The message is charity doesn't have to be money that you donate every month. Sure, I do. I do that myself because I'm in a, the right financial position to do that. But for somebody who's listening to this, charity means sending a video message to somebody that you love and reminding them that you really care about them. 
Charity is taking that extra time when you're at a restaurant and really thanking your server for doing such a great job. Charity is reminding the people in your life that you're there for them and that you're always a listening ear. And you know what the best part of all of those things are, Randy, is that none of these charitable things cost any money. And I wish more people did that. That's the random word exercise. Take a presentation, take a word, create something. I'm going to clap for you. <laughs> so <laughs> Thanks, that man. was awesome. So that was very good, folks. Yeah, you should be clapping as well. That was fantastic. If you're watching this on, on the YouTubes, on at Randy Wilson on YouTube, you should do that. Master Talks on YouTube. Yeah, that there as well. That was that was really good. So I would love to even break that down a little bit further if that's possible. I'd love to. So I love studying people that are great at their skill. And obviously that you've got that, right? So a couple of things that I picked up just in that presentation you gave to us. So if you're not watching this on video, folks, please go try to watch that this episode as you possibly can. It would be great for you to see how Brendan engaged physically as well as through his voice and inflections and tone and all that. So I'm not going to proclaim that I'm an expert because I am not. But at the same time, those are the things that I was picking up. Can you kind of go a little bit deeper in how you were doing that with inflection, with emphasis, with, I mean, your body, your movements. And so when to communicate properly, right, to be effective. And that was that was very effective. So, yeah, I'm just curious on how, how to do that even better. Thanks, Randy. And and you touched a, a lot of, upon a lot of great points already. You talked about vocal variety, tonality, how we speak. Let me start with the most important one because I like keeping it simple. That's really what I brought to this industry, simplicity and practicality. And yeah. here's the first simple thought. You don't get points for doing the random word exercise well. You get points for doing the random word exercise a lot. Here's what people miss about my shares. Because obviously I'm supposed to be good at the exercise. Wouldn't it be weird if I was a communication coach and I was <laughs> terrible at the exercise? It just wouldn't make any sense. So naturally, if, if I had the audience guess how many times I've actually practiced this exercise, a lot of people, funny enough, might go, oh, Bernie, maybe you've done it like 100 times or 300 times. Try 3,000. That's why I'm so good at the exercise. But 3,000 seems like a big number. But it really isn't because I just demonstrated it takes 60 seconds. So if you do it five times a day for a year, that's over 1,800 times. So getting to 3,000 actually isn't – it's difficult. It takes time, but it doesn't take 10 years to get to. So what's the message? The message is don't judge yourself and only focus on getting to 100. Let's use a similar analogy. Let's say you want to get more fit. You want to get more healthy. You want to lose some weight. Uh, you want to improve your body, uh, your body mass. You just want to be healthier. What does the personal trainer say in the first month of training? Do they go, this is a very specific regimen that we need to follow together. And we need to count your calories and do all this stuff. Of course not. They say, do you walk every day? And you're like, well, no, I don't walk every day. Well, that's where we start. And you'd be shocked, Randy, with zero uh, input from me. Just somebody doing their exercise 100 times makes them significantly better. I have not met a single human being in my life who came up to me and said the following. You know, Randy, you know, Brendan, uh, I've done the exercise 100 times. I'm actually worse than when I started. Nobody says that. <laughs> so that's that's the basic idea. Now let's break it down. Breaking it down means understanding that if I gave the word tree to three different people, everyone would approach the exercise differently. So the first person would talk about how there was a tree in front of their house and they would use it for shade. And then uh, their parents had to cut it down because it was getting old. Second person, you give them the word tree. They'll talk about the trees in the park that they love to visit as a kid. And then the third person will goes, why is there so, so many bloody trees? And they'll talk about forests and maybe the Amazonian river. But the way that I do the random word exercise, which is not necessarily the correct one, is I always like to tell a story. Then the story always leads to a lesson. And the lesson always leads to specific moments within that lesson. So in the example today, I talked about uh, – I actually already forgot the word. What was I talking about? <laughs> right there on your shirt. Right there on your shirt. Charity. Oh, charity. Thank you. And it goes to show you how much I care about charity, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, so charity. So I, I told a story about how I didn't like charity. And then after that, when I was younger, after that, as I got, I, I made more money, I learned a valuable lesson. And then I talked about the different moments that people remember with charity. Like charity is not just money you give, it's the time that you spend with people. But people should not be following this framework. All people should be doing is answering the question, 
Are you doing the random word exercise yes or no? Are you doing this with your kids? Are you doing this in the shower? Are you doing this when you're walking your dog? That's really the most important thing. And the mistake that people are making, Randy, in the same way that when you started this podcast, you probably sucked as a host, and now you're exponentially better because you just did more of it. And that's really the message I want to get across. Love it. So let's let's go there. So let's talk about getting reps in. So you've coached many people, right? And you've helped people get on stages and perform at a high level. Talk about the difference between someone that that hears what you're saying and and totally believes and buys in to doing the reps, to going through the word exercise every day, multiple times a day for however long it takes for them to become an expert versus the person that will try it. I'm just going to put my toe in the water and try it, right? I'll see how it works. And then they quickly fizzle because they're not committed to the process. Take me through that. Beautiful, beautiful question. Here's the way I think about this, Randy. There are three types of people in the world. People who run meters, miles, and marathons with the ideas that the universe gives them. So the person who runs meters might listen to this podcast while they're doing something else, which is totally fun. There's nothing wrong with that. But then after the podcast is over, they'll kind of just stop They'll forget about everything. Well, what did Brendan and Randy say? What's this guy's names again? I don't know. Let's go to the next thing. And they kind of don't really take action on anything. Not the end of the world. At least they're better than most people who don't even run me. They can just sit on their couch and do nothing. Second type of person, they run miles. So miles means they'll take a little bit of notes. Uh, they'll spend some time thinking about how they can apply this. They might do the random word exercise once or twice with their family. Then after a week or two, they kind of stop. And then you have the third type of person, the person who runs marathons with the ideas that the universe is giving them, whether it's on a podcast or in general. So they'll write a bunch of notes. They'll put the block in their calendar this week and every single week for the rest of the year to do the random word exercise at least once a week. So they'll say, okay, I'll do the random word exercise 10 times this week. Brendan just did it once on the podcast. It took him a minute. I think I could do 10 in a week. And then in a year, they might DM me and say, hey, I did it 500 times. Thank you so much. Right? So that's the person who's running marathons. And that person is often the same person who's really consistent with their workouts, who's really consistent with their family. Because the way you do one thing is the way you do everything. So I would encourage people uh, to find that consistency. The last piece on this, besides obviously paying for accountability, if you just want me to yell at you, then hire a coach. But if you can't afford <laughs> one, which I think is the bulk of this conversation – is is really about saying, okay, what is our motivation? Here's a question nobody knows the answer to, Randy. How would your life change if you're an exceptional communicator? No one really thinks about that question. They don't go, huh, like if I was a better communicator, how would my life be better? Go deeper on that question. Because for all of us, the answer is different. But if you find the answer for you, it's going to change your life. Like for you, Randy, it's obvious. It could be being a better father, but you already sound like a good father to me. But it's like being a better podcast. I mean, you're already great, but you know what I mean? Like even better or uh, impacting more lives. Somebody else might say, uh, you know, I just want to be a better mother for my kids. I want to speak to them better. Another person might say, you know, I'm really lonely right now. I really need a significant other or I really want to make friends or it could be I have this really big mission in the world. I want to make more money, whatever it is. No judgment. Just find it because most people don't think about it. You're right. I agree. Most people don't. I, but I, I will say that I kind of maybe put myself a little bit more into that category. I'm, I'm super curious about what gets people engaged, what gets people to take action, to do things, uh, whether it's marketing, copywriting, pers you know, even just communication skills, right? Leading from the, from the stage. You, if you, if I get in front of somebody that has the ability to communicate with words and paint pictures in your mind, to take you through a, a, a framework in your own, you know, I mean, it's like you can see it frame by frame of what's going on. I'm 100% engaged. And so that fascinates me. So you mentioned it in, you know, a part of the story a few minutes ago about stories. How important is and are stories in that process of being able to communicate effectively uh, a message of any kind, of, of any severity, right? You can be com communicating the most important thing in the whole wide world, and how a story really gets people engaged with that story or with that uh, communication. Absolutely, Randy. So storytelling is, is very important because that's what we remember. We don't really remember facts or numbers or statistics. And you'll notice that's why I don't share a lot of facts, numbers. Facts, yes, but not numbers and statistics because I forget them. So which means the audience is definitely going to forget them. Whereas we never forget story. 
But here's the way I would paint the picture. The way that I always approach storytelling is a quote that I use from Les Brown, who says, never make a point without telling a story and never tell a story without making a point. So the first time you hear that quote, you don't really get it. And I didn't really get it either the first time I heard that. I was like, what does he mean by that? So let me break it down. What Les means is that every great story often has a lesson attached to it. And the lesson doesn't have to be educational. It could be entertaining. I'll give an example. We all have that friend in our life, Randy, who comes up to us, who calls us, and he goes, buddy, bro, friend, I have something to share with you that happened last week that was wild. And then you're like, okay, cool. What happened? And then 20 minutes later, Randy, you're still listening to them, and you still don't know what the point is. And you're just like, why is this person still rambling? Like, what's the – it's been 20 minutes. So we all have that friend. And you seem like a really nice guy, so they're probably still your friend. But that's that's the key. What's the issue? The issue is the story's there, but the point isn't. But the opposite is also true. If you just give the lesson without the story, people forget the lesson. So if I just go, okay, Randy, you know, let's make this podcast really quick. Let's make it two minutes. Is all you need to do to do the random word exercise. But if I don't tell you who I am and where I'm coming from and the context that I'm speaking from, the, there's no emotional attachment to the lesson. So naturally, the lesson is just another textbook that you forget about that picks up dust. So the goal is to master both. And the best way to do that is to write a lesson that you want to teach and then find a story that is attached to the lesson. And the easiest way that I've approached this in my career is here's the lesson. I'll give it to you. I think anybody can be a great speaker. Anybody who's listening to this podcast can be a great communicator. That is the lining thread of every podcast, every video that I create, every coaching program that I do. Anyone can be a great speaker. So now the question becomes, what is the best story that allows me to prove that? So I could try a bunch of stories. I could tell a story about some kid uh, who was really nervous around speaking, got really good. I could tell the story of a client. All of this works. But the best one, is always my own. Hey, you know what? I was some kid in Montreal. I have a crooked left arm still. I was stressed out about speaking my whole life. I had to speak in a second language. I have an accounting degree. If I could become a communication expert, imagine what you could do with your life. And that's the story that links to the lesson. Love that. That's super powerful, folks. Yeah, re-listen to that part right there. That's one thing that I've discovered in my journey is that the my ability to really get my story honed in into a small version, a long, medium sized version, and then obviously a long version, right? You can have three different conversations with folks based on the interaction that you're having, but trying to get better at that, at that communication piece has been super valuable. And so, yeah, I love that. Yeah. So folks rewind that part. That will be super valuable to you going forward. So let's say someone's list out there listening today and they're like, yeah, you know what? I need to figure out how to get better at this communication piece. We already talked about the random word exercise, which that's a great place to start. But let's say they haven't necessarily been on stage or even online. Uh, let's touch base maybe online, maybe secondary. Maybe you can maybe go into that, right? Because to me, there would be a difference, right? Between getting on stage in front of a group of, it doesn't matter if it's 20 or 20,000, right? It's you're in front of people versus doing what we're even doing today, right? Getting online, you can go live at times and, you know, I'll leave the question at that, but let's say someone's wanting to move forward, trying to, to take those baby steps to get started, give them some encouragement. How do they, how do they bridge that gap from no experience to, to getting off the ledge and getting going? Absolutely. Randy. So there's two parts to that. One is how to get started in a way that's easy. And the second piece is just some tips that you're asking about for online presentation. So let's start with the three first exercise. So R, I call it RQV. So the first one is the random word exercise. The second one is the question drill. And the third one is the video message. But really what I encourage people to do, Randy, is to do all of these exercises on easy mode. So random word exercise, who said we had to do this in front of a stage? Who said we had to do this in front of 50 people? Like in this example, okay, sure, people are listening to the podcast. But when I did it, I really just did it in front of you in my basement. And my, I'm sure my parent, my mom's upstairs, but like, no one's really listening to me doing the random word exercise besides you right now. So really the encouragement I have for people is you don't even have to do it in front of others. Do it by yourself. Like I always tell people when I'm speaking to audience, I always ask you, hey, raise your hand if you shower every day. And the people who don't shower, I was like, I'm worried about you guys. You guys are really <laughs> seriously somebody. But, the, but I say, okay, naturally everyone, what are you doing for 15 minutes in there? 
do the random word exercise. For those of you walking your dogs, for those of you who have children, I love this exercise. I get my executives to do this all the time with their kids. It's like when they're picking up their kids to and from school, what are you all doing? They're on their phone and they're listening or you're listening to some boring ass music. Uh, you probably bleep that up, but you know what I mean? Like boring music. <laughs> so instead, like just, hey, do the random word exercise in the car. I love getting these videos. Like I got clients or just people in general in my audience who send me video messages of them doing the random word exercise with their kids. That's awesome. That's the key. And the key word here is have fun. Have fun doing these exercises. And that's what creates the consistency over time that I encourage people to do. Love that. So the have fun piece, how do you, how do you make it fun? Like, what do you do to make it fun? So if somebody's out there going, there is no way I, I would, I want to, but how can I, how do I bridge that, make that happen? So can you give us some tips and tricks as far as how to make it more fun? Absolutely. And I'm open to learning for this one too. If anyone has more ideas on how you can make this fun for people, let me know. But yeah, a couple of ways that I've seen that have worked really well. So the first one is to do this with other people that are just as excited about public speaking as you are. Let's use a running club as an example, or a yoga class, or a dance club. The reason why these running clubs work so well is because you wake up in the morning and you run with people who also want to run with you. So if you're running with Cindy and Julia and James and you make friends with these three people, well, you want to see them again the next day. So you wake up and go for a run. Not something I would do, by the way. I don't, I don't go for runs in the morning. It's not, it's not my thing. <laughs> but for other people, perfect. But I've applied that very well in the context of public speaking. And that started all the way back in college, going back to these case competitions. They really were like a sports team, Randy, where you have 80 people who do the program, 300 people apply to be a part of the committee. And then once you're in the program, you're pretty much practicing with everyone all the time. We were so intense that I wouldn't even see my families during Christmas or the holidays because the competition's January 5th. So we would all be at school just practicing. And it was that community that really bred the results for me. And if you can't afford an executive communication coach like me, which will run you a few thousand dollars, for those of you who can't do that, find a Toastmasters club. It's like 10 bucks a month. It's not that expensive. There's clubs all across the world. It's like 120 bucks a year or something. And you'll, you'll find some like-minded people that you can practice with. And I think that's really the key. And the other ways that I found fun, it, it doesn't apply to me, but it applies to a lot of the people I work with, it's really with kids. We have a lot to learn from kids, Randy. And you know this because you have a bunch of them. Is like when you're <laughs> giving them the random word exercise, they don't sit there and go, you know, dad, let's talk about the fear of judgment and the fear of failure. No, they just do the exercise. They go, oh, okay, a book. This is my book that my dad was reading. And they don't overthink the exercise. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from kids that we've lost along the way. You're right. I have a bunch of them. That was funny how you said that. I love that. I, I do have I do have more than one. That's for sure. So that's that's fantastic. Yeah. So Toastmasters. I'm not personally involved with Toastmasters, but I have friends and associates that have gone through Toastmasters and been involved in that organization. And they, I've never heard one negative thing about it, other than it pushes them outside their comfort zone. Right. It'll make them get up and do the reps and get up there and, and, and really craft that skill. So yeah, I would second that idea of, of if you're thinking about public speaking in any way of communication, uh, Toastmasters would definitely be a great organization. On top of Master Talks, we're going to keep talking about Master Talks as well, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. So let's, we talked about stories. So one thing, a question that was coming to my mind is if I want to be effective communicator, how much importance when you're practicing is visualization of being in that room, being in that space, or is it, I guess that's more of a question, is it important? And if it is important, can you describe kind of going through that process of putting yourself in that room, whether it's 50, five, going online, whatever, that process of visualization? Absolutely, Randy. So here's the way that I would approach it. I think visualization is really important, but in the context of communication is like juggling 18 balls at the same time, where one of them is body language, one of them is eye contact, one of them is knowing how to smile, one of them is vocal tone variety. I would place visualization in probably ball 15. 
or ball 14. So there's a couple of other things we need to master first before we get to visualization. Because you only really see the benefits of visualization when you're really good at speaking. Like Michael Phelps has a great video on this. For those who know, Michael Phelps is the most decorated Olympian athlete of all time. He's a good Olympic swimmer and stuff. And he, he has a lot of great videos on YouTube on visualization. But, you know, we're not all trying to be gold medalists in the Olympics. So, you know, so I would say at the beginning, it's really simple. Did you do the random word exercise 100 times? That's my checklist. Then the second one that I hinted out that I can explain right now is did we do the question draw? Quick story on this. So when I got started, I was really bad at answering questions, especially on podcasts. I remember some guy, Andy, asked me when I got started, hey, Brendan, where does the fear of communication come from? And I looked at him and I was like, uh, I don't know, man. Minneapolis? Uh, you tell me. New York City? Tokyo? I have no idea. So what did I do to fix this? Every single day, Randy, I answered one question about my expertise until I knew almost everything in my industry. So day one was, hey, what tips do you have for introverts? Day two is, what's your vision for master? Day three was, uh, what kind of routines do you have in speaking? But if you answer one question every day, Randy, you'll have answered 365 questions in your year you'll be unstoppable so do that a hundred times and then the third exercise is the video message just take out your phone pick somebody you really like could be a friend of yours uh, women love this so for those of you who have wives or girlfriends or if you have sisters or like uh, cousins who are women you send them a video message and just tell them how much you appreciate them, how much you love them, and they will adore you for the rest of your life. And the key is, there's one rule. The rule is you're not allowed to retake the video message. That's the only rule. Just send the video. And at the beginning, this will scare the bejesus out of you. And then after you do this a few times, then you get good. And then my last tip on this is called the BVM. There's something I do called the birthday video message where you send video messages on people's birthdays and i do this with a dumb 15 dollars amazon hat uh randy <laughs> that i send people and they love it now okay do you have the hat handy i would love to I see do. it i do oh i if we could pause the recording i could i could get you the hat I guess no so it's right no there. Yeah. It's all good. It's all good. I just was curious if it was handy because that was <laughs> I would love to see that. So when you do the the birthday messages, it's just hopping on, sharing a little bit of a story, and then wishing them a happy birthday, and then hit and send, right? Like I said, there's no editing, there's no nothing. It's just getting comfortable going through the reps, right? Even even what you said, Randy, is still advanced. I don't even tell a story. <laughs> like it's sometimes I like wake up. And I, I, I still haven't washed my face. Like I'm a mess. But I've I've such a busy day that I just go, you know, I take the hat. I'll show I'll show it to you off camera after the videos. But it's it's on my YouTube. It's all there. But I'll I'll show it to you after the show's over. And you just I just put it on my head and I go, I literally it's the same video every time. Hey Randy, guess whose birthday it is today? Is it Barack Obama's birthday? Is it Lindsay Lohan's birthday? Oh, wait a second. It's your birthday. I hope you have a fantastic day. Super appreciate you. That's it. And it's 15 seconds. People freak out over it in a good way. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's awesome. Yeah. We're going to yeah put a pin in that one. We'll see if we have enough time. I might come back and ask you another question about that because I'm just curious. Maybe we'll hit that one offline, like you said, and I can share it with folks if they have super, you know, a lot of questions about how to go doing that the, the right way, right? What software and all that kind of stuff. And the answer is there is no right way. It's literally, there's a Google calendar. It's like right there on my screen that renews every year. And it tells me whose birthday it is. And then I literally just open my phone. I go to the social media account that we're connected to, whether it's text, whether they all have video functionalities. Just find it, click it. Hey, send. That's it. There's nothing else to this. <laughs> <laughs> and like you said, I'm making this more difficult than it needs to be. So that's that's the lesson that we learned here in this this one part of this episode, folks, is don't make it any more difficult than it needs to be. So let's pivot a little bit into more of a corporate setting. So as I mentioned, I was in uh, retail for 20 plus years myself. I've sat through so many meetings and mundane conversations and poor communication, just so much. I just want to pull all my hair out. Can we talk a little bit and help maybe some of those folks that are listening that might be in corporate settings, whether they're participating, they're upfront, or they're be even being asked to present maybe some different parts of the skill set as far as whether using a PowerPoint or, or a slide presentation. Um, maybe give us some high level tactics as far as how to be a 
better presenter in a, in a corporate environment. Absolutely, Randy. Let's start with corporate meetings that you touched upon that I think is really interesting, which is a lot of people aren't very good at them. <laughs> they just really aren't. Um, one of my mentors, Jeff, told me once, and I love what he shared. He said, Brendan, employees talk in circles and executives talk in pyramids. And I said, huh, like, what does that mean? And he goes, you know, when you ask an employee, so somebody who's lower level in a company, hey, you know, what's the status on the project that you're working on? They'll go, uh, you know, uh, you know, Randy, um, I, I talked to HR and I talked to IT and then this happened and they just start rambling. It goes on and on. So they're talking in circles. Whereas you ask an executive what the update is, they go, hey, Randy, great to see you. This is the update. These are three points that we need to consider. And this is what I feel we should do next. What do you think? So they're always talking in pyramids. So what's the advice? I'll give you something really easy because I've actually struggled with teaching meetings to my corporate execs because they're all structured differently, like all the meetings. But for status updates, when you're just telling people what you're working on, it's consistent across the board. And the framework is called ACE. A-C-E. And ACE stands for acknowledge, count, and evaluate. Let's demonstrate. So acknowledge means when an executive or just your boss asks you, hey, what are you working on right now? Always start with my four magical words, which are great to see you. Great to see you. I know they sound really simple, Randy, but notice when I say the words great to see you, Randy, even if we just met on this call, there's some part of you that feels like I made a deposit. It's like, oh, I don't know what it is about Brendan, but I just like this guy. Whereas the mistake that a lot of us make is we just go, oh, okay, here's the update. We don't try and build the relationships. That's A. Don't talk about their dog. Don't make this a 10-minute conversation. And even if you hate your boss, say great to see you. So at least they don't know that you hate them. That's A. C, count. Count just means count the number of updates that you have. People usually ramble in meetings, and the problem is your boss or your boss's boss doesn't know when you're finished talking, and they got 10 other meetings that day. And you've led a team of like 30, 50 people in retail, so I can imagine that you've had that situation too. Where they're talking, you're going, okay, I, want, I care about this person. I want to listen to this person, but I got a PL to run. Like I got a business to run, so I got to go to the other team right after. So whereas if, if I'm your mentee, sorry, if you're my mentor and you're my leader and I say, hey, Randy, I have three things to share with you right now. You, there's like an ease. Oh, okay. Brendan's going to be finished talking after three points. So I know when to interrupt him. And then the last piece to ace is evaluate. A lot of people might start strong, Randy, but they'll finish weak. So they'll go, they'll talk. And then when they're done, they'll stop talking. And then the executive will go, uh, are you done? And it's just really awkward. Instead of just saying, that's it from my side, happy to take your feedback. That's it from my side, happy to take your feedback. Why do I like that languaging a lot, Randy? Because you're signaling that you're finished, but you're also signaling indirectly that you're open, you're coachable, and that you're open to feedback. If you always say, happy to take your feedback, Randy, happy to take your feedback, after I say that 10 times to you, you'll bring me aside and say, hey, Brendan, you know, you're always asking for feedback. I really like that about you. Here's two or three things I think you should work on. And then in six months, when you want to pick your successor, because you're going to get promoted, you're going to pick me. Because I'm the person you're you're mentoring on the side. And you're not mentoring everyone else. So I'm the person you're grooming for the next role. So yeah, this is like my little tricks. That's Ace. Love that. <laughs> Ace. Yeah. Remember that, folks. That was super powerful. So let's say you're in front of a meeting and it's it's not going well, right? You're, you're losing the group. Everybody's starting to check out. Like you said, they're already thinking about the P&L that they've got to go work on or the next phone call or the, or the next meeting. Can you describe maybe a scenario where... How do you get it back? Is there a way to, to to get that back, to get that intention besides jumping up and down, maybe doing some jumping jacks, or, you know, screaming at people? There's got to be better ways, right? So yeah, I'm, I'm curious if there's if uh, you've got a better way to do that. Yeah, Randy, there's one that's reactive and one that's proactive. So reactive just means something that we can only do in the moment. And proactive is what can we do before the meeting to make sure, you know, the chances of that happening are a lot lower. So let's start with reactive. Usually if I start to lose the room, what I'll start to do is I'll start to ask people who are paying attention to me what they think. 
So I'll pause the meeting and just go, hey, Randy, I just want to hear your thoughts. What's resonating with you so far from this conversation in 20 seconds? I just want to hear. And then I'll do that with – depending on the size of the room, if there's 10 people on the call, I could do that with everybody. 30 seconds each. It takes five minutes. If there's 100 people on the call, won't work. So I'll need to pick five to six people that have their cameras on, and I'll just ask them what they think. That's the way I would approach that to regain the attention and just see what's – uh, unresonating. Usually the, within those five people, Randy, one person will often ask a question. Hey, Randy, uh, I mean, not Randy. Uh, hey, Brent, actually, uh, could you expand more on this? But what they're really saying indirectly is, I didn't understand what you said there, but they're not going to say it that way because it's not polite. So they'll say, you know, Randy, looking at your vision, what you're sharing, I just missed number two. Could you expand on that a little bit more? And that's how you get their attention. And the proactive thing to do is to not mess up in the first place. And the best way to do that is to practice, right? Get your ace together. Really understand who your audience is. Are you talking to the engineering team? Are you talking to marketing? What does marketing care about? Like a lot of us go, always ask ourselves the question, what's in it for me? What does this mean for me? But they never think about how can I deliver this in a way so that I'm giving you what you need. Right? It's a very easy switch, but it's one a lot of people don't make. And it's one that's required if you want to go to management like you've done in your career. Yeah. So knowing your audience, knowing who you're speaking to is so important. And even doing this, right, uh, with the podcast or jumping on another interview or anything like that, you've got to know who you're speaking to or else you cannot communicate effectively at all. That's, yeah, that's super powerful. So one question I had, and I don't know if this relates or not, but I'm just, I'm just curious as far as the communication piece. One thing that I try to do well also in my communication is written communication. I don't know if this correlates at all with written communication at all, even just short snippets, meaning obviously we're in the, the Twitter or X kind of lifestyle as far as like 150 characters and trying to get messages across. Do any of these communication ideas and theories and things that you've uh, frameworks that you've created do they they correlate into the the written word as well for communicators for sure randy i don't consider myself a written communication expert i'm a lot more of a verbal communication guy, as you can tell from the podcast but what i would say is that some of it definitely does in the sense that if you get better at structuring your ideas uh, out, out loud it's a lot easier for you to do it in written and the way that I like to approach this is you can actually get better of one or the other. Let me explain. Let's say you're really, really good at written and you're not that great at verbal. The solution becomes take what you're saying in a written format and speak it out loud using a free voice recorder on your app. That will allow you to articulate the structured thoughts that you're communicating very well on paper, but you're not able to bring it out when you're speaking. So let's say you have a status update meeting. If you're great at written, you're terrible at verbal, this is the best opportunity for you to get a post-it note, write down those three things, and just use that as a cheat code. It will really help. Let's tackle the opposite now. You're really good at verbal, you're not that great at written. Guilty as charged, that's the category I would fall into. I'm a lot better at verbal than I am at written. So in that case, there's a couple of ways you can you can approach this, but my favorite one is when you're speaking out loud to gather your thoughts together, use something like otter.ai to transcribe what you're saying and then go through that. And that will help you then create the written format behind your content. You still have to rejig some things, structure some things a little bit better. But it's in general, it's been very helpful to me and just people around me who manage my media stuff where it's like I talk and then we create it. And then obviously the third piece is just to force yourself to work on your weakness. So if your weakness is verbal, just force yourself to do the random word exercise. And if you're not that good at written like I was, force yourself to do more copy and you'll just get better over time. Get the reps in, right? That's kind of been the theme of this episode is if you want to get good at anything, it requires practice. It requires reps, which I, I love that. Love that message. Hopefully you're picking that up, folks, as you're listening today. So as we start to bring this one in for a landing, man, I just want to first off say I'm, I'm so grateful for you to spend your time, your energy, your wisdom with us here on this episode. So first off, I want to say that to you, uh, that how grateful I am for you to join us. So we've shared a ton. I mean, this episode is packed full of ideas, concepts, frameworks, all kinds of things in terms of communicating more effectively, whether you're in charge of teams, building a business, even with your family, 
Just curious. I'm going to try to dig out one more, one more nugget of wisdom. Just one more. Come on, man. One more. I know you can do it. Yeah. One more. Can you pull out one more nugget of wisdom to share with the audience? Some, maybe even if it's just inspiration to try to help them get started and get better at this communication skill that is so crucial if you're going to survive and do well here and thrive in 2024 and beyond. I'll leave the, the floor open to you, man. What do you, what, what do you have to say? Yeah, for sure, Randy. You know, I felt we covered a lot of great ground today. We talked about work. We talked a lot about consistent exercise we can do like RQV. I think the only thing left to cover is how do you get better in your personal life? How do you communicate more effectively with the people around you? I'll give you something that, that I do from time to time that has helped me a lot. And that is two things. One is to take notes on the people that you really love. You know, even if we might not care about our birthdays, because I really don't care about my birthday. My birthday's actually Wednesday, and I really don't. I just remembered as I was talking. Mine right. is Thursday. Oh, you're May 2nd? That's so cool. Have, happy birthday. That's cool. It's so cool your birthday's in the afternoon. So, but even having said that, I still don't care about the birthday. But it, I think it's cool that we share very similar birthdays. But the yeah. point is, is even if I don't, everyone else around me does. Like I, I send a hundred and fifty. Uh, okay, I'll say a hundred to be conservative. I send a hundred birthday video messages a year, and I don't even care about my birthday because it's not about my birthday. It's about my employees' birthday. It's about my friends' birthday. It's about my business partners' birthday. So in the same way for your significant other, and significant other can be best friend, it could be children, it could be people. I don't have a good memory. Okay, the only reason I sound smart today is because you're asking me things that I know a lot about. But if you start asking me things outside, I don't know. So I'm literally going to tell you, like, I have notes. I have this weird habit, actually. It's really funny. All my best friends know this about me. Is let's say me and you're having dinner, Randy, like in Indiana for some ra random reason. I'm in Indiana and I go, you're the only guy I would call. I'd be like, yeah, I could talk to Red. He's in Indiana. So let's say we're having dinner and you say something really smart and I go, oh, that's a really good insight. I'll literally open my phone. I'll, I'll make a note with your name on it and I'll write the insight. So with your significant other, write down when their birthday is, what their favorite color is, all this. Because as men, we'll forget all that stuff. We already know it. We can't change that about us. So let's just write it down. So that way, when the test comes, whether it's our, uh, the anniversary dinner or whatever, we'll keep passing the test. It's easy to pass. It's a test. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, a test. test. <laughs> it's a and test. it's easy to pass. <laughs> it's just most people aren't putting the effort. Not doing the work, right? You got to do the reps, got to do the work, right? And it requires pulling out your phone, take it or taking a note. So you can do, even do it hard copy, right? Write it down somewhere. Keep notes. That's awesome. That's Fantastic. It. Yeah. Great wisdom, man. I, I just knew this was going to be a super fun conversation and I appreciate you showing up and bringing so much energy, bringing so much wisdom. If folks are out there and they're thinking, okay, I need to figure out how to get better at this communication piece. I need to get Brendan on my team. I need to figure out how I can get in close proximity to him, learn from him get better at this craft of communication. Where are the best places for people to get to know you better? Absolutely, Rand. The easiest way to keep in touch is Instagram. Just follow my handle, Master Your Talk. Your is spelled Y-O-U-R. And just send me a DM and let me know what you thought of the episode. And happy to send back a voice note. Fantastic. And folks, I encourage you to do that. Uh, let Brenda know how much you appreciate him showing up today and adding so much value. I, like I said, I knew this was going to be a super fun conversation. It's something that I study. I'm not going to say as I, as I did at the beginning of the episode that I'm an expert at it by any means, but I'm super passionate about paying attention to folks that have the ability to communicate, to persuade, to lead, right? You can tell the difference between someone who really takes their practice and, or takes their craft and practices it to the point of perfection or, or mastery and those who do not, and the ones that can are the ones that are leading the world, really. I mean, it's it really comes down to it. You can lead the world, you can lead your family, lead your business, lead your community, if you can do it in the proper and, way. And, and in today's episode, so much nuggets of wisdom were shared to help you on your, on your journey to become a better communicator. So Brendan, man, thanks for coming on the show. It was a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully, maybe we'll, we'll get you down to Indiana. We can meet you face to face. Who knows sometime, huh? <laughs> Definitely, Randy. This is my promise. First of all, thanks for having me on the show. This is a blessing. I really appreciate you. And if I'm ever in Indiana, you're definitely the guy I'm calling because I got nobody else to call in Indiana. So you're the guy. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm the guy to call. So folks, folks, if you're in Indiana, I'm the guy to call. Reach out to me. You can find me on Instagram as well. You can leave me a DM. Yeah, let's connect. But anyways, yeah, reach out to Brendan. Get on his, uh, we talked about Master Talk, his YouTube channel. That'd be another place as well. And we'll have all the links in the show notes for you to connect with Brendan uh, and get uh, your skill set in terms of communication honed in so that way you can craft a better message out there in the world, in the marketplace. So go out there, have a fantastic day, focus on being great. I look forward to bringing back the next guest again very soon. And until then, bye now. Thank you for joining me on the Rich Mind Podcast. And remember, your external world is a reflection of what's going on inside of you. So focus every day on that internal battle and win within. Until next time, my friends.